let me start recording. So, please. Okay, away we go. Um, yeah, so leadership as a service. Uh, I, I think we'll take a similar structural look at things for the next 10 minutes that, that we did uh, last week, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. Uh, and by 10 minutes, I probably mean 20. Um, so to begin with, why do we care about leadership as a service, or much less servant leadership? Uh, are these things the same? And what problem are we trying to solve here? Uh, we have a lot of businesses that have been running for a lot of years without uh, an awful lot of servant leadership, even when it's been given lip service. So why is this important? Um, in the 1960s, I have to admit, I'm a little bit of an old man when you come down to it. Um, in the 1960s, it was much easier to do social psychology experiments than it is now. Um, and a whole collection of experiments were done by um, uh, people in the States that these days would be regarded as unethical. And we're going to look at a couple of these. Um, the first started with this ad placed in the paper. Uh, at the time, $15 per day was actually pretty good pay for a college student to come and spend some time in a social psychology experiment. And no one thought that it was going to be terrible. Um, the basic idea was that people would um, pretend to be either guards or prisoners in a simulated prison. Uh, it was supposed to run for two weeks. Uh, after a little over five days, if I recall correctly, the experiment had to be shut down because the guards were abusing the prisoners so badly. Now, I have to stress, these were not uh, psychologically deranged people. They were not prison inmates or prison guards. They were just college students, and they all knew that they were taking part in an experiment with people that they would need to continue having social interactions with for the rest of their college career. But the, um, the abuse that occurred... Uh, became quite reminiscent of some more recent images. This is actually an, an image from the experiment shortly before it was shut down. Um, and pretty obviously, that's a scary outcome. How did that happen? Um, Zimbardo was the name of the guy who ran this experiment. It's also called the Stanford Prison Experiment. But um, there's an even more infamous 1960s experiment run by a guy named Milgram. And um, in this experiment, well, um, two people were brought in by the experimenter and uh, who flipped a coin and one of the, the people would become the teacher and the other the student for a, a memory experiment. And the way this experiment worked, the student was strapped into a chair and hooked up to some electrodes. And the teacher was instructed by a man in a white coat uh, to read a list of um, numbers and if the student was not able to repeat them back, then the teacher was supposed to administer a very mild electric shock. Um, and the, the uh, purpose of the experiment was to observe the effect of, of punishment on, on memorization tasks. Or at least that's what the, the teacher was told. In fact, the entire setup was bogus. And the, the teacher was really the subject of the experiment and the student was just a tape recording in the other room. Uh, so what happened was that every time um, a wrong answer was given that the man in the white coat would instruct the teacher to increase the voltage on the experiment. And, um, well, the reason this is unethical, apart from the fact that, well, it just seems unethical, uh, the, the poor buggers who were experimented on as the teachers, they were given no counseling afterwards. They, they were put under enormous psychological ex stress. It, it, whenever they said, look, I, I, I'm hurting that person in the other room. I, I, I want to stop this experiment. The man in the white coat would simply say, you are required to continue. Um, and um, where this really becomes scary is when we, we look at the results. Um, what they found was that 65% um, of the uh, teachers who are just ordinary people recruited off the street were willing to continue even after the tape recorded subject the tape recorded student pretended to have a heart attack and die they would keep administering electric shocks now you might think well uh, perhaps um, perhaps they figured it out maybe maybe they 
they didn't think that this was serious. But obviously we have uh, a lot of historical precedents that, to suggest that people, when they are following orders, disengage their brains. And in order to disengage their brains, they only need the slightest uh, uh, authority or hint of authority. A, a white coat was sufficient to do it, much less calling people masters and owners. So the point of all of this is that in Agile, we're playing with fire. A, a lot of the ideas that we've got around how we set up Agile teams, um, they might not be very well framed. And we haven't thought through um, what the effect of this stuff is. We know, though, that m in most corporations, we have committee think, we have hierarchies, we have um, poor decision making. And we know this because companies that don't do those things are able to just walk by their competition. So these are all quotes from Steve Jobs. Uh, he gave a, a, um, an interview to Walter Mossberg uh, where he explained uh, the very most basic ideas about how Apple worked. He didn't talk about it in as much depth as we're going to talk about today because the way that Apple worked was regarded by Jobs in, in, and by the company in his era as uh, an extremely important trade secret. So what we're going to look at on the Apple end of things, um, maybe it's the way Apple works today. Certainly we see different behaviors happening in Apple today. But um, these ideas of having zero committees but, but tremendous teamwork, how do you do that? Uh, uh, teamwork depends on trusting people to come through on their part without watching them. Okay, that sounds wonderful. But how do we make certain that works? Um, if we're going to let the people involved with us make decisions and let the ideas, the best ideas win, uh, how do we go about doing that? Yeah, this is a heretic thought, Peter, right? I mean, having yeah. competition of ideas within the organization. I mean, remember, most of the people went through these, these hoops of the annual budgeting process, and now they have budget yeah. and they want to spend it accordingly yeah. to their ideas. And then you come back to them and ask them for participating once again in a competition of ideas. Mm -hmm. You're being rejected, you know? Um, being told your audition is not good enough, your idea is not good enough for this organization. You know? Well, we see this uh, uh, on a much finer level in Agile. When we do um, big room planning and we have scrums of scrums uh, leading up to um, uh, uh, the powerful people in the room, uh, we're reinforcing all of these kinds of um, tendencies to fail to consider the ideas. The, the hippos win. Uh, highest paid person, if I recall correctly, for hippo. Um, uh, high, highest paid person's opinion, yeah. That's it. One, yes. one of my favorite acronyms, actually. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that next week in product backlog entry patterns. <laughs> how to, Very cool. How to defend um, from, from hippos. Uh, yes. Uh, so the, the, the basic idea here is that the way we're organizing ourselves, we talk about self-organizing teams a lot, but we don't provide any protocol for them. We talk about servant leadership. We, we don't uh, explain how that's supposed to work. If you have someone in uh, your team who is not fostering, who is not adhering to a protocol that generates servant leadership, then how can you be a servant leader? So um, if we... Consider some historical precedents, people who've worried about this problem. Uh, the one that we, we talk about in um, uh, the XBA course is this gentleman, Von Moltke, uh, who has this wonderful quote about, I think everyone's heard no plan survives contact with the enemy, but each officer acts on the basis of his own view of the situation and productive action is controlled by the superior framework of intent. Whoa. That's a very powerful statement. This is a, a guy who um, uh, was a field marshal in days when people used to line up uh, uh, opposite each other across a field as if they were chess pieces and shoot at each other. And this guy invented um, an idea called Auftrag's tactic, which became what we know as um, Blitzkrieg in the Second World War. So he really revolutionized the way that military organizations uh, able to get things done, to take the command and control out of the way things worked and instead to make uh, 
a, um, a framework of missions and submissions. And that is kind of familiar to us in Agile when we talk about epics and features and stories. Um, Although, I, I, Peter, I, I have to admit, my being German, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit frightening to say, okay, our, our idea of uh, becoming Agile organizations is somewhat slightly rooted in the ideas of a Prussian general from the 19th century. I completely agree with you. It's scary. <laughs> um, uh, we don't need any Agile Nazis. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, but at the same time, if we don't let the ideas, the best ideas win, if we dismiss them because of where they come from, um, then, uh, well, we're, we're being a bit silly about it. So this idea of a superior framework of intent, that's really neat. Uh, if the framework of intent is to commit terrible purposes uh, to reality, then, then, well, that's not so neat. So I, I think it's more a matter of let's consider the tools uh, and not necessarily what was done with them. Yeah, and, and the tools proved to be very successful, right? Um, go, yes. go for your objective, reach your objective, uh, and figure out how, how to do this. So, uh, and trusting the people closest to the problem to come up with a solution. Yes. Well, perhaps... What to so do, gone. how to do it. Yes. Well, perhaps let's take a, a step further back. We're, we're, we're talking about um, leadership as a service and or servant leadership. A lot of people trace servant leadership to a man named Greenleaf, who's written quite a lot about it. But um, most of his ideas go back, ooh, about 4,000 years. Now, I admit this is not actually a picture of Lao Tzu. This is a picture of Tony Randall, because, of course, there are no pictures of Lao Tzu. And, in fact, most likely Lao Tzu didn't exist. Um, uh, like um, most famous historical figures, the story grows and grows until we have um, mythology that is far uh, more important to people than whatever the words were that um, inspired the mythology. But um, uh, there's, um, there's a book that I've wound up working on for about 30 years. I call it The Agile Tao. It's a, uh, a refactoring of Lao Tzu. And, um, and so I, I took a little bit from, from that. As far as I can see, this is um, very much uh, the intent and the content of what was handed down. So this idea that a, a great captain doesn't lead his ship as a jade figurehead, but steady her as a stone keel, that there is um, this overarching framework of intent, the direction we're going, is not what the leaders are worrying about. Leaders are worrying about setting a vision, an intent to go forward, and, um, and then not sitting at the front going, okay, you do this and you do that. Uh, governing by simplicity to help people live together in peace, with no laws but to secure trust, no taxes but to promote trade, no goals but mutual benefit. That's beautiful. Um, is that something that we can bring into the kinds of large organizations that we, we hope to use Agile with? Uh, we need a, a pragmatic way to go at this. Just the philosophy by itself is not going to help us. Um, if we are going to oppose the kind of top-down command and control, uh, waterfall-ish Agile frameworks, uh, then we're going to need a concrete way to go about it. Um, so, if I move forward, a lot of the reason we have these um, uh, ideas around command and control and hierarchy is because they solve real problems. They give us ways to organize ourselves that we wouldn't have any other way. Well, perhaps not any other way, but they give us a very immediate way to do things that we all understand. Um, and it, it, it never ceases to amaze me how quickly people will assemble a hierarchy. Uh, in XBA, we have to uh, come up with a whole, um, a very carefully thought out arrangement of patterns to be able to um, to work with to work with communications and learning across hierarchies, because um, the hierarchy is going to form anyway. We we have to way, have a way of working with them. And this is a picture. Um, that um, it comes from uh, a North American civilization, or uh, uh, perhaps it's symbolizing the way that its particular North American civilization worked. There's a civilization called the Haudenosaunee. Um, the Europeans called them the Iroquois. And um, we're going to have a, a little look at how they got things done and then try and bring that back into a, a Steve Jobs context. Okay, so far, Stefan? Yes, absolutely. 
So there's a lot of symbolism in that picture, and we're not going to have time to go into it all. Um, I want to look more at um, uh, how to take the kinds of metaphors we're familiar with in Agile and understand what the Horton and Sony were doing, because it's actually got a lot in common, and then they went further. I think that most Agilists are very familiar with this picture of squads and chapters and guilds and tribes. Um, but uh, there is some potential problems with this picture, uh, at least this picture in the context that it's, um, that it's been adapted into. Uh, Spotify uh, folk uh, often say there is no Spotify model, or if there is, don't try and do it. That uh, really, uh, this is something that evolved, and it's not something that you can just imitate and expect to get good results. Um, one of the weird things about this picture for me is um, uh, Spotify talks about the Dunbar number, uh, of which they say is 100 people. Robin Dunbar is still quite happy and healthy and alive. He's not someone who was trekking through the Amazon in the 19th century. Um, he suggests that for modern corporate uh, cultures, uh, it's more like 60 to 80. So uh, the science behind this is not settled. And when people turn up and say, oh, well, we're going to have a tribe of 100 people or 150 people, they, are, um, they really don't have an awful lot to back them up. Um, so we're much better off looking at finer grain things like this picture here. A, a tribe is not a hundred people in this picture. The tribe is what? Uh, 30, something like that. So, um, we, um, we need to take all of this stuff with a grain of salt, but the patterns, they're really interesting. The chapter meetings, that's a really powerful way to organize ourselves. We looked at that a little bit last week when we were talking about X DevOps. So, um, but I want to think about this in the context, um, of a real tribal society. And that's where the Haudenosaunee come in. Uh, these are people who um, had a civilization of about um, a million souls uh, for 500 years. So this is not a, 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 some primitive thing that you, you find uh, in some backwater. These, these people uh, were stable for a long period of time. Haudenosaunee itself um, means um, either the, the people of the longhouse or the people who build which is to say engineering was very important to them. And a lot of the science that they came up with, uh, particularly agricultural science and a science of, of um, social science, um, uh, it, it still has many things in it that, that are uh, of value. Um, uh, the Europeans who had experience of working with the Haudenosaunee, uh, Franklin and Jefferson and so on, were, were uh, very strongly influenced by this culture. And actually, the ideas uh, were taken to Europe when those guys visited uh, France. And um, uh, when the ideas communicated uh, into France in the form of Rousseau's Republic, well, basically, uh, the ideas that came out of Haudenosaunee culture ended up generating both uh, the uh, French and American revolutions, or at least they were very instrumental in doing so. Of course, there were many other causes. But this picture we're looking at, these people did not live in tents in a nomadic way. Uh, they farmed, they had permanent settlements, two-story buildings, a row of open fires down the middle and such a clever system of venting that um, uh, the smoke from those fires was taken directly out of the building to the chimneys. And on each side of these five fires down the middle of each building, uh, there was a family of four or five people, which is to say each of these longhouses um, was um, was about 50 people. So it's easy to count up how many people would be in this village. Um, the way that they governed themselves was by treaties, both treaties within each longhouse between the, the various family members, or actually clan members that cut across the families, and treaties across the longhouses um, that allowed the people who were living in them, or the clans um, that cut across them, in the same way the chapters cut across uh, the squads in Spotify, allowed them to make agreements uh, on how they would get things done, where the latrines would be and so on. So um, this system of, of making treaties um, is very sophisticated, far more so than, than the way that we govern um, our organizations today. And it worked at many different levels. So um, when they looked at their own social structure, 
the Haudenosaunee saw this longhouse idea reflected at every level. So actually, if I go back to the village for a moment, you can think of each group of longhouses as like a set of five families on each side of a fire, except there's no fire, there's a corridor going down the middle. So uh, this is effectively a longhouse of longhouses. Um, and then they thought of the villages on either side of the river as very similar to having families on either side of the fire in a longhouse. So they, this was a tribe, a tribe lived along a river. It was a set of villages on either side of the river that they thought of as a longhouse of longhouses of longhouses. Um, and this metaphor continued a nation. There were five nations originally, they made it six eventually. And so um, a, a nation was a longhouse of longhouses of longhouses of longhouses. And when you get up to the level of the international uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, where we have a million people, they regarded this as a longhouse as well. And at every level, the clan structure, which is very much like chapters, but sort of more fractal, allowed them to define councils to do consensus decision-making. And we'll look a little bit at the um, protocol for that in a minute. Um, so I just showed you a European map of um, the Haudenosaunee. This is a Haudenosaunee map. Uh, at one stage, uh, it, they called it the 59 families, but basically you can think of each bead as a village and each string of beads, because this was made with beads, each string of beads as, um, as a tribe. And so here we are looking at a tremendously rich social structure. Um, we're looking at a million people. Um, and if you compare this map with the way that we map our society or our corporations or our portfolios, we don't have these structures. We are, we are lacking something. The, the ability to make agreements and to continuously refresh them, refactor them um, peer to peer, uh, that's something we don't do. We don't do it at any level of our society, and they did it at every level. So there's a lot for us to learn in terms of structuring an agile organization this way. Let's define your case so far. Yeah, Peter, I mean, <clears throat> that I believe there's a reason why we have organizations uh, of the kind we enjoy air quotes today. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of those uh, derive from the industrial area. When mm -hmm. you train farmers' boys in Michigan to assemble Model Ts, Yes. Um, the first thing you had to do is to make sure that they would all appear at the beginning of the shift because mm -hmm. you can't run the assembly line uh, with half of the people missing. Yes, you basically want them to act like little, little machines and that's yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how to turn a human being into a cock in the machinery. Um, yes. But why, why are we still are so attached to this uh, scientific management approach, um, air quotes, uh, to organizing companies is it just an, an issue of, of legacy because they're still around um, mm -hmm. or where are we supposed to go from here i mean the idea of um, you need to have a team of teams is is not new i mean you can even write bestsellers mm -hmm. based on that idea and apparently if we have a look at the north american continent uh, in the 17th century it's, it's already been mm -hmm. um, experienced and tried out and it was working in the past Mm -hmm. why, why do we have to reinvent the wheel? I, I completely agree with you. We don't have to reinvent it. One of the neat things about this particular culture is they wrote down their uh, method of making consensus decisions. Uh, it's called the great law of peace, or sometimes just the great peace. And there's, a, there's, there's practice patterns in there that we can apply in a very direct way uh, to get... Um, consensus decisions made and to get learning to flow across the hierarchy. So, but to come back to your question, why, why, why do we do things the way we do? It's a little bit like um, uh, asking, well, why does a horse with blinders on only see ahead of it? Uh, uh, the ideas we're looking at here, they're not current. If we talk about the Haudenosaunee with anyone in uh, uh, the agile culture, uh, we get blank looks. So we've forgotten our history, and you recall the, the great quote about uh, those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. So because we, we don't inquire, we don't look at how else could we organize ourselves, um, well, we don't see any other way to organize ourselves. And everything that goes on, even though we know it's not working well, it seems inevitable and natural that it doesn't work well. But here's a great historical example of something 
that worked far better, and we know it worked far better, because there was enormous attrition from the European colonies to the Haudenosaunee, particularly among women, because this was a matriarchal society. But across the board, it was a very attractive way to live uh, when your alternative was uh, 17th century structures. So what, where did we go from here? Well, let's try and simplify. Let's get it down to what we can actually do day to day. This is all beautiful, but, um, and I, I would love to talk about this more. We've been, we've been doing a bunch of research on this and to extract patterns from it. And um, uh, it, it's, um, there's, it's such a rich culture in this that, uh, and also I'm talking about these people as if they didn't or uh, still exist. They, they certainly do. They, they became um, disenfranchised as a political power. Uh, in the American War of Independence. They had treaties with both the British and the colonists, and uh, they wound up with three nations fighting with the British and three with the colonists, and they fought each other, and then they weren't included in the Peace of Paris, which was uh, where the, the 13 colonies were declared independent. And, uh, and then a whole bunch of things happened that happened to many First Nations people around the world. Um, so uh, I don't want to represent this as a, some idyllic story where uh, everything is all great. Obviously, uh, these are people who face very strong challenges in their society today and are actually kind of trying to come to grips with their, their own tradition to be able to handle those challenges. Sometimes some of those traditions don't work as well. So we need to cut all of this down, make it far simpler. So, um, so I, I want to start with the very simplest protocol I can think of that resembles the way they did things. And actually, we do do the following thing today. Um, if, if, you, um, if you are trying to make estimates in planning poker, and uh, let's say three people in your team say that it's a three, and three say it's a 13, and despite multiple rounds of planning poker, they cannot agree. Uh, what a scrum master will typically do, actually a wise scrum master, a, a crappy one might take votes or average it or something. Uh, a wise one will go, okay, what really? What's what is the the bone of contention here? What is what is this decision? This estimate really about? This is a database story. Jill is our DBA. I'm going to hand. If you guys can't agree, I'm going to hand this story to Jill and ask her to um, to make the decision for us. So that idea of having someone who decides the decider. Jill says it's a three or it's an eight or whatever it is that she decides, but she makes the most informed decision she can because she is the most on the hook for it. Um, Everybody else then has a motivation to make trade-offs, to be able to, um, to avoid losing their agency, their, to avoid losing their say in a decision. And this is something we can do not just for estimation. We can do it for prioritization. We can do it for disagreements about acceptance criteria in a product squad. Anytime we have a little team of people who have to make a decision together, this idea of identifying someone who we could call them a leader and say, oh, well, they'll make all the decisions if you guys don't get unanimous. Well, that would be a primitive form of this. There is another form of this to do with um, directly responsible individuals. And this was applied at Apple. Um, uh, so the idea with Apple was every agenda item in any meeting had to have a DRI against it. And while the meetings would work very hard to try and get people aligned, to try and get the best ideas to win, if they couldn't agree, then whoever was uh, chairing the meeting, which in this particular uh, diagram is almost certainly that bloke in the middle, um, well, they would pick um, whoever it was who um, was the DRI for the decision and get them to decide. Likewise, when that DRI went back to their team, and they would say, okay, well, now we have to make some sub-decisions, then they would decide the decider. So this method of um, in, its protocol uh, of, of um, deciding the decider and then identifying directly responsible individuals for specific parts uh, of the product that's being uh, generated by the team or by the stream, um, this, is, this is very powerful. Um, and obviously under jobs, it generated incredibly good outcomes, even though Jobs himself is renowned as a, as a corporate tyrant. Uh, if you actually go and watch the way that his meetings ran, because there's a bunch of videos of Jobs at Next on YouTube, if you go and watch them, you will see that he is a tyrant in terms of 
making certain the people in the room adhere to protocol. That he wants to get the best ideas together. If someone is going to object to something, he wants them to put to forward a reasoned argument, and ideally one based on numbers. So um, this kind of leadership does not mean you can't have a strong and decisive leader. Uh, it, it means that you uh, first make room for consensus decision making and then give time limits or event limits on when you would stop using that form uh, so that that way you know you're going to get a timely decision. And you also have individuals identified who will carry responsibility for execution so that they have a real stake in the outcome. And they, they won't just go, oh, yeah, I can sort of agree to that because, you know, the, our team will do it together. Okay, so far? Looks nice to me. Hmm. I expect we're going to have quite a lot of questions. We'll see how we go. So um, to finish up, uh, this is basically the same diagram we looked at last time. We have uh, a, a set of patterns that um, are based on the idea that we can have autonomous squads for making decisions together. And um, we have uh, chapter meetings to enable the decisions that the squads make to be aligned um, across a value stream and then it, that the value streams make to be aligned across uh, a portfolio. Um, and we use leadership as a service in the little representative councils that we uh, put together. These, these are councils not of people drawn from the squads or from the streams. They are councils of people drawn from the clans, sorry, the chapters that cut across um, those units. And that way people are able to get eye to eye before they even propose a way of working to be ratified at a council and ultimately to be ratified by the people who would be involved in delivering. That's a longer story. Um, we have uh, a collection of practices that are around breadth first product management and that's to enable us to come up with the superior framework of intent and if you watched the podcast that we had on uh, 3d kanban uh, or the one on on seven samurai kanban you'll have an idea about how we structure that so that we minimize the number of moving parts the number of cards in the wall we, we don't violate uh yagni that is to say you aren't going to need it and then we have a portfolio council where we're able to um, align our value streams and look at the kinds of HR, resourcing, competency, financial, and compliance matters that we have to deal with in a portfolio. But again, we're dealing with uh, representatives of chapters. And we looked at that uh, uh, last week. So point of all of this is we are trying to maximize the flow of learnings through the organization, and in particular, across the hierarchy that inevitably forms in the organization. And this gives us a set of very simple practice patterns to do just that. I think Great. I'm out of gas, Stefan. <laughs> Good closing thought. So, any questions from the attendees? Um, you can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of the Zoom window. That would be the easiest, or you use the chat tool. Let's see. By the way, I found another uh, quote from, from Lao Tzu. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is yes. aimful, full, they will say we did it ourselves. Yes, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, it comes just after that bit about the the, um, mm. uh, the leader needs to be working as a stone keel, not a jade figurehead. Um, but mm. there's so much pithy stuff in that, so uh, we could talk about that for... Actually, one of our um, coach trainees, Dov Sal, uh, and I are putting together a podcast series on the Agile DAO, uh, which I hope will get published sometime this year. We'll see. We've done a few sessions for it, but... Uh, it's on hold because of work, work commitments on both our parts at the moment. Anyway, yes, it, it, there's tons of things we can do with, with um, those sorts of learnings. But again, we always have to bring them into our current context and ground them in something practical or else they're just words. Yeah, but the nice <sighs> words. Yeah, yeah. Now, do okay. we have any other nice words from folk? Oh, come on, don't be shy. There must be someone who thinks I'm full of shit. Oh, hang on, something's happening. There's a Q&A thing. Awesome. 
Gideon asks, would you use the pattern language of when the leader does not represent the team? Oh, that's a really good one. Uh, we have many corporate cultures and world cultures where they're very dependent on leaders not representing the team. The leaders have to be able to, um, I'm thinking about Singapore, where we have hierarchy from Lee Kuan Yew all the way down to the street sweepers. Um, and so there we can use this leadership as a service pattern as a way to come up with the best advice we could give such a, a leader who doesn't represent the team. A leader who did not take that advice presumably has some uh, concrete political reason for not taking it. Otherwise, they're just silly and they won't get ahead. So, yes, you can. There's lots of ways to, uh, to water this down. The basic idea is still uh, just around trying to um, use the threat of um, overruling the team as a motivation for the team to make a consensus decision through making trade-offs. In, um, in the Haudenosaunee uh, great piece, this happened at multiple levels, but in particular, um, if they had um, members of multiple clans trying to make a decision, um, if they couldn't make a decision in time, they had a role called a war chief. So imagine you've got uh, some hostile tribe coming over the hill. Uh, you don't have time to get your council to agree on exactly what tactics are going to happen. This is kind of a, a scrum mastery or a managery thing to do. You've got to uh, give orders and, and sort things out. And then afterwards, you can have a council where you, you, uh, you deal with any excesses, including excesses that may involve removing the person who is in that position. And there's a lot of mechanisms in the Great Law of Peace for doing exactly that. So that, um, that war chief was someone who had very sharply constrained execution responsibility when it came to uh, making decisions. Their responsibility was entirely about making certain that um, the representative councils, the clans, and so on, that they uh, observed protocol in doing so. Didian, did that answer your question? We may have killed him. Um, so, if I had back a bit, oh, hang on, let's see. Uh, the chief would be removed by the ladies if the uh, chief did not represent the tribe. So how would you avoid it? Would you rotate the leader? Ah, that's a very good question too. We, um, we have a pattern we use in um, uh, something we call the game without thrones, which is one of our teaching games, but actually we're uh, upgrading it into uh, a method for um, DevOps squads to um, work together and um, uh, it, it, to work on code together. We're actually looking at this as a way to take some of the Woody's Will ideas about mobbing and add a little bit of formalism. Um, so uh, when, when the, the matriarchal clans in uh, the Haudenosaunee, uh, they had the ability to remove any of these chiefs at any time. The chief had to represent the clan, and if they um, didn't do a good job of it, then uh, they talked about removing the horns from the chief's head. Um, Stefan, were you going to say something about this one? I think this is the, the most dreaded part of the whole idea. You know, you're losing the, in, in the, the, the signs of power, the insignia of power. Mm -hmm. It's like being removed from the corner office today. You know, yeah. Who's ex yeah. exercising control over parts of the budget. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a good question, though. I, I imagine that you did have this ability for the group to um, remove their manager. There's actually a pattern that um, Nick Argel, one of our Aussie coaches, raised um, that he's had experience of called Manager Once Removed, where they separate out the functions of um, supervision and evaluation. And so you're, you are evaluated by your supervisor's manager um, rather than by your manager. And uh, if in that evaluation it becomes clear that uh, your manager is not making very good decisions, well, your manager's manager can simply mm -hmm. raise you up a level. Um, that, um, that's a, one of those ideas that, that sounds neat, but when it comes to putting it into practice, uh, there's a social context that goes with it that might be quite difficult to work with. Um, one of the neat things in the 
the Haudenosaunee way of doing it was that um, the decisions that were made were only temporary. And there was a, 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 a harvest-oriented cycle of councils to revisit them. Uh, in this picture, the gentlemen who are the brawny blokes off the back of the room, um, they are the war chiefs. And in the council protocol, their job was to represent issues that uh, uh, the rest of the people in, in their respective clans uh, wanted to submit to the council. So the ladies on the left-hand side are picking councillors. The council is a, 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 a meeting, but the ladies have their own council. And the way that they divided responsibilities was very cleverly thought out. It's completely impractical from our point of view because um, making decisions and dividing those decisions along gender lines wouldn't work with our current culture at all. But there are ways that we can set those checks and balances up so that um, these kinds of decisions become much easier to deal with. Um, I mean, when we look at um, portfolio council, we can talk about them in more depth. Sorry, Stefan, what were you going to say? Yeah, I think there are, you can already see signs of these kind of, of negotiations and treaties going on. So what I really fun, I'm fond of is one of the management 3.0 practices where you, um, mm -hmm. where you run a delegation poker, where you come mm -hmm. to a, to uh, an, an agreement with the management, so to speak, and the team, okay, who, who's taking care of what, mm -hmm. uh, at what level. Um, mm -hmm. So the, uh, there seems to be this, this, this idea that uh, self-organization means uh, we're, we're without management, which I believe is uh, totally impractical, but you should talk about, okay, who's doing what and who's responsible for what, which comes mm -hmm. to a certain extent back to the uh, DRI on the one side. Mm -hmm. It's also possible, okay, how do we limit this? Uh, when, do, when are we going to revisit this? You know, I find it interesting. On the one side, we have working agreements within teams concerning, okay, how, how do you deal with uh, talking in, in the open space when you receive a phone call? But the really critical issues like, okay, how do we come to conclusions or how do we make the decisions and mm -hmm. how do we do so in a timely manner? And uh, yeah. basically left, left out of the discussion. You know, it's... Uh, Sometimes like you're polishing the outside instead of really addressing the, the critical issues. So John Ferguson Smart and I have been doing a little bit of work on how we formalize descriptions of these sorts of agreements, agreements across um, squads or across, across streams or across portfolios. And um, it's something he's going to be speaking on uh, next month. He calls BDD treaties, where we take uh, BDD acceptance criteria and lift them up so that they are constraining the undertakings that we're expecting each other to observe around how we split responsibilities up, how we shift work around, how we communicate, and so on. Um, there's a, uh, I agree, Management 3.0 has some beautiful stuff there, and so, for that matter, just sociocracy um, and, and uh, holacracy and so on. They, while some of the stuff in um, some of those frameworks um, may not be um, uh, practical, in one or another organization or may not no, uh, no, so work well. <laughs> so, so, uh, certainly not. I mean, it's, yes. we're always clinging to these, these, these icons of, uh, of Zemco, Patagonia or Hire, for yes. example. I mean, there was, was a nice interview with the Hire CEO last week. And uh, there's, there, there was one quote that, that really stuck with me that, uh, where he mentioned, yeah, we, we, we fired about 10,000 middle managers because they didn't provide value to the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, Funny that approach, um, but I think uh, a lot of organizations are currently not not built to absorb that kind of approach, right? Yes. Um, so th then we get back to uh, what we've been talking about before around change models. That uh, uh, we can't expect an organization to um, take this on as a, a whole as bold as any of these things and try and change all at once. What we have to do instead is cherry pick the change champions from the organization, just a few of them, make this work in the small, it's a very slender steel thread. And then by splitting and doubling and having the people who join each half uh, learn by immersion, we grow the capability, we grow the culture, we pull people into the culture rather than trying to push culture into existing teams and streams. And that enables uh, really s significant uh, cultural um, capability uplift uh, without getting people into a, a confused uh, half a cow, half a fish kind of a state. Great.
Pete, thanks a lot for your time. We're already beyond the time box we originally intended. Um, no we will, next week, um, I won't be available. I will be on Scrum Day London. But, um, That's okay. Week after. Two weeks from now, we will meet yeah. again, right? Awesome. Yeah. I have an idea about what we might talk about. Please. Well, we've done a lot of very broad stroke stuff. I think it would be nice to take a single one of our um, product management practices and, and really drill in and understand how we use this stuff and why it's useful. And I'm thinking of Pirate Canvas. What do you think? Perfect. Let's do that. Good idea. No worries, mate. Okay. All right. So, talk to uh, you again on May 18th, and we will be talking on the Pirate Canvas. Yes. Have a great weekend. See everybody then. Thanks for participating, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Bye.